Uh, and good morning uh, and welcome to the 19th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. And we have just one of our colleagues just joining us. Um, welcome to you. Good morning to you. Um, the first item in our agenda is to take evidence on the funding of EU competencies in our own table format. And we're joined for this discussion by Joe Armstrong from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Professor David Bell, Professor of Economics at the University of Stirling, Amanda Berger from the community-led local development group leader, uh, Professor Serene Diamond, the principal and vice chancellor of the University of Aberdeen, Jonathan Hall, the director of policy and member services at NFU Scotland, and Diane Milne from the Dundee City Council, who's part of the East of Scotland European Consortium, and David Phillips, who's an associate director at the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Uh, this session is going to differ a bit from our usual session. Uh, in terms of a, a formal evidence session. It's obviously intended to be a round table, much more free flowing discussion than the normal standard and answer type of event that we have. Um, and the round table we have this morning has been structured around five themes for the discussion uh, as set out in the meeting papers and I intend to allow around 20 minutes for each one. Now I know inevitably with a round table discussion it will and it's free-flowing, it may well cut across the, the, the areas that we've laid down in terms of the structure. That's inevitable to some extent, but we'll try to keep to the areas, these areas. And I'm going to invite one member of the Scottish Parliament um, to initiate the discussion of each of the themes following that, to allow the participants here to set out their views. So if anyone wants to make a contribution, if you can catch either my eye or... Alan, the clerk's eye here, then that will help, and we'll try to allow you in at the appropriate time, uh, and as I say, we'll try to make it as free-flowing as we can. Whether I can keep to the 20 minutes in each bit of the structure is another story. We'll see where we get to. But the, So the first theme that we're going to begin this morning on is on governance issues around EU funding, and Ash Denham will kick off and lead off on that area. Ash, over to you. Thank you, convener, and good morning to everybody. Um, so the current structures for intergovernmental um, engagement that we have at the moment, so that would be things like the JMC, um, have obviously, you know, how well that that system works in terms of reflecting, you know, things across the whole of the UK has been questioned in a number of different areas, including in reports by um, this committee and by some committees also at Westminster. So I suppose there's an opportunity here to look at um, what we might do post-Brexit um, what ways that those structures could perhaps be updated and also to make sure that perhaps they don't repeat the same mistakes that have hampered um, the current structure. Um, has anybody got any ideas on how um, we might move forward post-Brexit in that area? I'm looking at the two Davids to see who wants to volunteer first. I was going to say, I think that David Bell wrote more about the governance uh, side of things in, in his response to the uh, committee. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I think when it comes to thinking about kind of um, the, the, the governance of it, I mean, it seems to me there's kind of there's, there's two elements to that. There's the kind of governance between the Scottish government and UK government, uh, which I think with the GMC, um, that kind of uh, issue there. But also there's kind of the governance within Scotland. And that's an important kind of part as well, the relationship between Scottish local government and Scottish central government and the role of the voluntary sector in kind of, a, kind of governing uh, kind of the post-Brexit funding arrangements. Um, and I think there is kind of uh, an issue that arises is, I mean, I, I think there's a question about whether the British government will want to, in some instances, I'm not saying this is a good thing or not, but whether the British government will want to actually have direct relationships between British government and local government in Scotland and organisations in Scotland. So I think what's not clear at the moment is whether the Shared Prosperity Fund will be something that is... Um, providing money from the UK government to Scottish government to then set up the properties in Scotland, or whether there will still be an element where actually individual city regions or local authorities or groups of organisations in Scotland bid directly to the UK government for those things. So I think, um, as well as thinking about kind of the relationship between the Scottish government and the UK government, it's also worth thinking about, you know, Scottish government to local government and local and subnational things within Scotland to the UK government, because I think it's not clear at the moment where where that area is going to end up. I agree largely with, uh, with uh, David there. You know, in a sense, we've got a mixture already in terms of these 
governance relationships. And for example, if you think of city deals, uh, the UK government um, and the Scottish government dealing with um, uh, local government in uh, sort of arranging st stakeholders uh, to set up these deals. Um, we've got that on the one hand, and then we're trying to merge with that, assuming that the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund in some way mirrors what the structural funds uh, have been doing in the past. Um, we've got a system uh, where we have been used to effectively the EU on the one hand, with an intercession by the UK government, I've got to say, and I mentioned that in my paper. Um, and then really in terms of day-to-day -day administration, most of the relationship going from EU to, uh, to uh, uh, Scottish government. Um, and um, we've also got the issue that, that, you know, the principles on which the, the structural fund uh, has been based are, are around areas of need, uh, whereas the cities, uh, city deals are around kind of getting local stakeholders together, um, whether that area is, you know, particularly needy or not, and trying to merge all of this with possibly the UK industrial strategy as an over, overarching uh, strategy for the whole thing it seems to me to need some really, really clear thinking around the governance uh, issue. And uh, I don't know uh, uh, at the moment what the answer to that is. And similarly, if I can just switch the attention to agriculture, you've, you've got similar problems there in the sense that if we are going to do new trade deals, um, the UK government uh, will be, since we'll have a common tariff uh, uh, with whatever countries we're doing deals, the UK government has got an interest in, in uh, a global interest in, in agriculture, uh, and, we ha and the Scottish government uh, has a local interest in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that rural communities continue to thrive, that sort of thing. And uh, there's really a strong need for uh, for. Uh, uh, a, a greater level of intergovernmental cooperation around that, and, and you do see that in, in countries like Canada. Okay, does anybody else like to reflect on that? Any other MSPs as well? I want to just, sorry, um, Alex, um, is Jonathan, is it? Yes, uh, if that's all right, I just, just on the agriculture point, but not on the trade issue in particular, it, I'm just curious, actually, thinking about this now, in the sense that the EU and common agricultural funding that comes to the UK, um, the EU views uh, the UK as the member state, uh, but thereafter, in terms of the audit and accountability processes, it looks at different paying agencies in each of the devolved administrations. So in terms of governance, uh, the Scottish Government is accountable to the EU auditors of various forms uh, on a very regular basis, much to their annoyance, quite a lot. Um, but I'm just wondering what the situation would be post-Brexit, whereby we would have to have some centralised audit of future agricultural and rural development spending, uh, and who would take responsibility for doing that work of the, the European Commission in terms of ensuring that the allocation of taxpayer funding uh, is done fairly and is accountable and so on. So w I'm not suggesting for a minute that the UK government or either or the Scottish government becomes the European Commission Mark II, uh, but nevertheless, we will have to have something in place that says where funding is being allocated across the United Kingdom and being spent by different administrations, what is the governance process or audit process to make sure that that's being done in a fair and robust way um, as we currently have a, at a European level and that would suggest to me that you probably need some sort of UK body like uh, an enhanced JMC of some sort that can oversee that uh, across different administrations within the UK. Joe? Yeah, my, my point probably follows on a little bit from that one but it, it comes back to the principles of why why are we spending the money? What are the objectives of spending the money? And therefore, the governance requirements to make sure that the spending actually delivers the objectives as stated, which probably requires a finer, a more greater clarity around the rules about which the funding is being used for. And then the point about how you're then making it accountable and, and, and auditable. Um, 
and the the spatial level at which you then uh, do that accountability or, or auditing has to take account of both economies of scale, um, but also local needs and local local requirements. So if we're moving away from what we've currently got and we think what we've currently got isn't necessarily fit for purpose, I think we start with why are we doing what we're doing and what are therefore the objectives that we're going to set, and therefore the governance should follow that and the accountability and auditing should, should follow that. Okay. On you go, Amanda. Um, really just to flag up what Johnny was saying, from a leader perspective, where it's very much funding from the grassroots up, and decision making is made at a very local level. So within Scotland, it's funded under the Scottish Regional Development Programme, um, but there are 21 local development strategies that have been made in concert with the grassroots. So each one of those local action plans reflects the specifics of that local community. And across Scotland, they vary greatly. And I think one of our fears would be that if, dis if the governance is then moved even further away from it than in Edinburgh, that the, some of that local competency will be lost. Yeah, I'll just pick up that wee bit more, because it is a bit probably in terms of the overall scale of things, the, there's a danger that things like leader, which are smaller bits of the pot, get missed out. But it's still worth, the, I think, £77 million over the programme time. So it's a substantial amount of money, and it's a different model, because it's obviously delivering at a rural level where local people are making decisions about what's happening in their communities. As far as I understand, there's almost 500 projects in Scotland already through the, the leader process, which have released about £31 million from leader fund, but levered in another £47 million. So that issue, I don't think we should allow ourselves to forget in terms of that structure and, and that model of delivery is different to other ones. So thank you for drawing that out. I'm very grateful. Ivan. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I mean, just just an observation on that. I, I suppose, rowing back from just some of the comments there, it would depend, wouldn't it, on whether the funding was going to a UK level that then set the objectives, or whether the funding just went to the devolved administrations who then set their own objectives. It might be very different, because I can envisage uh, the scenario you're talking about, where the UK government was involved in setting objectives. Yeah, you, you it would get kind of a bit complicated trying to figure out how you were going to but if it's just in a Scottish only context don't we have mechanisms already in place and we've got charities regulators we've got audit Scotland we've got a whole in framework institutions that, that manage public money where it goes check it's been spent correctly etc is, is that not already in place to, to some extent David um, so I think that's true and I think you're right that the kind of uh, requirements for kind of governance and uh, uh, audit and management will depend on, for instance, is it just being kind of rolled into the block grant and this complete freedom of how the Scottish government spends this money, um, or whether actually the objectives are being set at the UK level and Scotland has freedom within certain kind of bounds and parameters. I think there are some areas, though, where you might want kind of, uh, if you like, kind of external assessment. So I think agriculture, the point that kind of David raised, even if it is um, actually in terms of the, you know, the, the the management being done at this kind of Scottish level, it, because it interacts with UK kind of trade policy issues, there will want to be kind of some role for the UK in that. And one thing I was kind of wondering, um, where there are things that are kind of joint competencies, right, where I say agriculture could be kind of joint, in effect, a joint competency because of this issue of it's a devolved policy measure, but it interacts with UK trade policy and it needs to conform to certain UK level rules for our trade agreements with maybe the US and Canada, etc. Um, in those kind of circumstances where it's sort of a joint responsibility, could it be some sort of arrangement where it's joint between Scottish Audit Office, National Audit Office, Welsh Audit Office, where they kind of form kind of committees between them? Um, potentially you could even have, um, I don't know, someone from England, Wales, Northern Ireland auditing Scotland, someone from Scotland... Wales, England, or Northern Ireland, etc. So there's some kind of external critique, but everyone is involved, so it's not just being dominated by Westminster. And maybe that could be an approach um, to take. Okay. I don't know. I think this is an area where there's a lot of don't knows at the moment. But, uh, but, but how, get this is the purposes today is to get these views on the table, so we we'll know what to look forward to. Um, uh, Jonathan, you want to go? I just yeah, I, I would I would echo the point just made that in that uh, you know. It, it, in likelihood, although nobody can actually predict this with certainty, is that 
in, in replacing the common agricultural policy for the United Kingdom, we are looking at something like a commonly agreed regulatory framework applied across the United Kingdom to cover all sorts of standards, uh, largely to protect intra-UK trade as well as enable the negotiation of trade deals out with the UK, etc. Um, in terms of things like animal health, environmental standards and all these sorts of things. So lots of governance issues there in relation to how finance uh, is spent or indeed uh, penalties on, on payments, for example, and so on. But thereafter, in terms of actual delivery of support payments, as we have now under the Common Agricultural Policy, you have four separate settlements across the United Kingdom, and each devolved administration has their own paying agency, which is ultimately accountable to the Commission. So th I think it's a bit of a hybrid between having something that, that looks at accountability across the United Kingdom in terms of how standards are being met and regulations are being enforced, um, but equally in terms of where funding is allocated and giving to individual businesses to ensure that there's full traceability on how that money is being spent. So I, I can see uh, the, the National uh, you know, Audit Scotland uh, playing a very serious role, but probably alongside other audit administrations across the UK. Well, I see Diane, you wanted to come in? Sorry, don't need to touch that, sorry. Thank you. Um, my experience is very much at a local level. I work for a local authority, so I only have the experience probably between the local authority and the Scottish Government um, at that point. But I think what we see is, even at that level, the level of transparency has decreased considerably in recent years. So in previous programmes, there was a lot more peer review in terms of the application process and in terms of decision making. And to be honest, we don't see that at all any longer. We rarely see any of the papers that are related to the Joint Man Monitoring Committee in Scotland. They're not published on, on the Scottish Government's website regularly. I don't think they've been there since about you know, 2016. I haven't seen a paper. So I think from our perspective, it's, it's about more transparency within the process. It's about clearer rules. We were recently in Brussels, and they're very clearly talking about potentially having what they call a single rule book across all programmes. So I think that's what we would be looking for as well, and that we would make sure that any governance arrangements were the same, regardless of the programme that was coming forward. We see them, comp they're all completely different at the moment, regarding leader, ESIF funding, um, you know, e the fisheries funding. If you use any of those, the processes are different. And even within ESIF funding, every strategic intervention lead that's managing money is delivering it in a different way. And I think if we're looking at governance, we need to look at it from the bottom up as well as from the top down, and that process needs to be adapted. Good point. Jo? Sure. I agree with transparency, I agree with clarity, and I, deal with, I agree with rules. However, the downside of rules means that you've got less flexibility. And a lot of the streams of funding that come in typically come in because they are dealing with a particular problem that has arisen and therefore may not be co um, conducive to apply the exact rules as a, that applies else, elsewhere. The other thing I'm uh, kind of the, the microeconomist in me kind of uh, wants to bring out is the issue around displacement. The more that you have lo local control, the greater the chance of displacement activity elsewhere within the economy, either at a UK level, a Scottish level, or even at, even at a local level. Now, th that's not to say we don't, ha we don't necessarily accept some level of displacement but if we don't have a discussion about displacement then we create um, activity that doesn't actually generate uh, net overall economic growth or net social benefit. Ian, is there any particular things from the university sector that you'd like to draw out in terms of governance issues? Now, the thing I would note in the university sector is that largely we apply for funding and get it or not or don't get it so the actual governance is around are you achieving one project or not. But the non-European but UK-wide um, position that I think is helpful is that research is funded uh, according to something we call the dual support system. So there is a project f for a particular project, but there is also a block grant. Now that block grant uh, it comes because of uh, UK research and innovation. It comes to the Scottish Government, and the Scottish Government can choose how it, uses, how it wishes to use it. And the Scottish Government um, has something called a Research Excellence Grant, which goes to each university. So far, so good. There is, at the moment, a very 
large and exciting program called the Global Challenges Research Fund, which uh, is funding research to alleviate poverty in low-income countries. The block grant that is associated with that has also, because it is joint with the Department for International Development and the Department for Business, Enterprise and Industrial Strategy, that funding has to be for um, low-income country work. So as a university, one gets now two pots of block grant, one block grant that you can use in any way you want and which universities can show has enormous leverage of other funds and a block grant which you have to be audited against for uh, its contribution to research to alleviating poverty in low-income countries. Now, my, I support that very much, but my fear is we could end up with all kinds of relatively small pots which have to be used in particular ways. It is much easier to be able to have uh, a university-wide economy which says we're going to try to improve uh, research in ways X, Y, and Z without having to think which block of funds is being used for which piece of money. Okay. Well, one thing to know for sure after this morning and that discussion is that it's a very complex picture we have out there in terms of the very, diff the very different arrangements that are, exist in so many different programmes. And Well, I'm, gl I'm glad we asked the question. I'm not sure what the answers are. Does anybody else want to, before we move on to structural funds, anybody else like to make a point about governance issues? Well, well, David? I, I mean, I, I I just wanted to, to reiterate uh, Joe's point, which, which I think is, is very important. The, you know, there is an opportunity uh, at the moment, I guess, to have a look at all of this kind of funding and uh, to decide whether it's delivering in aggregate what, what we intend it to do. You know, we're looking for sustainable economic growth. Um, are the are the kinds of uh, initiatives that uh, are encompassed by European funding delivering the kinds of objectives that that we want uh, uh, for Scotland as a whole, and we haven't you know we have tended not to try to do evaluations of say the structural funds and uh, and so on and. It's quite tough to come out with with very c clear conclusions as to as to whether these objectives have been delivered. Now we see down south, um, at least in relation to agriculture, that uh, a, a kind of uh, strategic decision is perhaps, well, we're out at consultation at the moment, is perhaps going to be made, which is around the support of uh, uh, public money only for public goods. Now, we haven't had that debate in Scotland. I, I'm not saying I support it one way or the other, uh, but you know, we have to think what it is that we want our agricultural uh, funding to, to achieve. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity to, to think about these issues. I, don't, I mean, just to tie that back in more directly to the, to the conversation about governance, uh, and it, this picks up on something that I think that Ivan said, um, which is that you know, we, we are, um, one, of the thing, one of the questions we have to think about in terms of designing our governance arrangements is what we want the governance to be governing. If we want the governance to be governing joint policy making, so that, for example, you know, to take that DEFRA example that you've just put on the table, David, um, that it would be a UK-wide policy that we want agricultural support to support public goods. And if, if, that's a, if, that's to, if that's a UK-wide policy decision, then it needs to be made, it seems to me, through an institutional structure that enables the four governments of the United Kingdom to come together and agree that as a policy outcome. That's a very different sort of structure for governance arrangements from the one where you have a single set of, of very broad objectives being filtered down and delivered by different administrations in different ways. So it, it's not just a question of what you want to achieve that will determine the governance. It's a question of what it is you're trying to co-own, what it is you're trying to co-govern. To co um, but m my reflection on th this conversation is, is, I suppose, this, that I think there's a kind of puzzle that we are much nearer the beginning than the end of about how much post-Brexit we want to copy and paste EU structures um, uh, into the UK post-Brexit. Do we want to have a system of centrally imposed directives uh, in the UK that enable each administration in these islands to 
um, pursue common goals through separate means, which is what European directives do. And we don't have anything like that in UK law at the moment, neither in England nor in Scotland nor anywhere else. Um, that's, that's one question. And if we don't want to do that, what do we want to do instead? And the other, you know, for me as a lawyer, the elephant in the room here is that no one's talked about courts and dispute resolution. And the big difference between the way EU law resolves disputes arising out of these issues and the way in which we have hitherto resolved disputes arising out of these issues in the UK is that in the UK, our JMC machinery that Ashley Allen talked about in her opening remarks is entirely political. It's informal. It does not use the courts. We do use the courts for disputes between central government and local government in terms of funding but we don't use the courts in terms of disputes between um, UK government and devolved governments in terms of funding or anything else, uh, apart from you know, questions of competence. We don't, we know in terms, in, terms of, um, in terms of the JMC machinery, there's no judicial architecture attached to that. So the, one of the big questions I think here for uh, us is, is the extent to which, if at all, we want to make these questions, what lawyers would call justiciable questions, which you can litigate in courts. That's probably a good place to move on to the next set of discussions. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want anything else to say. Because I don't, I don't think MD, MD can be, we can spend all day asking, and, but that question's got to be answered, but it's obviously something we need to, everyone needs to think about and we, as we go through this journey. Um, so we'll move on to funding mechanisms. Um, Murdo. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. And, and we, we sort of touched on this briefly in the previous discussion, but I want to open this out a bit and look at what are the, 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 the most appropriate mechanisms for distribution of funding across the UK post-Brexit and what impact this might have in Scotland. And David Bell and your paper have written quite a lot about this particular issue. And it seems that you know, there are two kind of broad approaches. One is to say, let's in effect replace EU funding mechanisms with UK-wide structures, which will allocate funding on some agreed basis. And the other approach is to say, in effect, we will, we will take Scotland share, however that might be determined, or the devolved administration share, and just give that as part of the block grant to the devolved administrations who will then have flexibility to divvy that up as they see fit without having that UK-wide element. And I'm, I'm wondering what the views are in relation to these two different approaches. And if it's the, the, the second approach, how then do we determine what Scotland's share is? Um, is it on the basis of the Barnett formula, which of course is only been applied in the past to changes in Scotland's uh, budget allocations, because if, I, if I'm right, Scotland's share of, of UK spending has historically been much higher than our population share. Um, so if it was done on a Barnet basis, it actually would represent a, a reduction in, in, in the proportionate amount we were getting. Uh, and if it's not done on Barnet, how else might it be done and what the implications are? So that's an easy one to start with. And when you're doing that, you can maybe explain to us. <laughs> there seems to be a difference of view about whether the, a Barnett formula process will be advantageous or disadvantageous to Scotland. And I'd like to understand that a bit more. And I don't know, it's probably starting with the two Davids again here as well to get this kicked off. And I'm, I'm not doing that intentionally to you, but... OK. Um, so I think on this kind of disagreement you're saying, or kind of... Um, uncertainty about whether Barnet would be uh, beneficial or costly to Scotland, it sort of depends on what we think is going to happen to the level of funding um, once you kind of initially set the level up. So starting off, um, the Barnet formula will not tell you what to set the initial level of funding to be. You would need to make that decision at some other way. It could be to set it based on, um, you know, existing allocations of EU funding, it could be based on some other assessment of uh, spending needs for the different areas that are going to be funded by these replacement funds. And then the Barnett formula would in effect um, be beneficial if over time those allocations were to be reduced in cash terms. And that's because when you sum up agricultural funding and um, uh, development funding, Scotland gets uh, quite a bit more per head than England does. And then going forwards, the Barnett formula would say give the same per person, pounds per person change in funding. So if Scotland started off with, say, £200 per head and England £100, and it was being reduced by, um, you know, one pound a, a year per head in England, well, England's getting a one percentage point fall every year, Scotland would get a half percentage point fall every year. So when, when funding's been cut in cash terms, uh, Scotland benefits from the kind of Barnet-type per-head arrangement. Um, 
However, when funding per head is increasing in cash terms, that same one pound per head increase is a 1% increase in England, but only a half percent increase in Scotland. So Scotland kind of loses out when funding is increased in nominal terms under the Barnett formula. Um, and I guess this is where kind of the uncertainty is. Um, we, uh, the, the kind of the messages from the Westminster government on agricultural funding certainly suggest uh, reducing the direct payments to farmers over time, but it's not clear if that means a reduction in overall levels of funding uh, for for rural areas, or whether it will be shifted more into just, just shifting the funding from direct payments into rural development and greening initiatives. Um, I think for uh, regional development, um, we just I mean, I, I'm not sure there's really any signal there about what what the likely uh, outcome would be. But what I would say there is, I mean, a cash terms freeze is quite a significant reduction over time. Um, if it was say a real terms freeze. Because that implies that it's still going up in cash terms, Scotland would lose out from a, a real terms freeze in, in England because it's still a cash terms increase. It should be, sm should be small in percentage terms in Scotland. So it really depends. Do you think in cash the budget's going to be falling, in which case Barnet is good for Scotland, or rising, in which case Barnet's bad for Scotland? Okay. So the, 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 that's that's exactly the point that I made I made in my paper. So I won't repeat. <laughs> no, no, David's absolutely right. Uh, it all depends what's happening with the cash budget, whether it's going up or down. It's advantageous to Scotland relatively when it's going down, although that may still mean a cut in its funding. It means that it's less of a cut than England's getting, basically, and that's why. In the paper, I give the example of the Pillar 1 payments. If, if, if they disappeared, then actually Scotland would still have some money at the end of it, uh, even if the amount of spending in England diminished to zero. But I, I think, again, um, in looking, agreeing with, with, with David on the detail, that there's the question of, of principle here. And I point out, firstly, you know, if this money goes into the block grant, that means that effectively... It's in competition with health, with social care, with education, uh, all the other uh, uh, forms of uh, funding. And, and we know there are pressures right across the system uh, uh, at the moment. Um, and the other thing is, I think, uh, Bruce, that you mentioned at the kind of at the start, um, uh, and, and the Barnett formula, in a sense, doesn't help because it isn't, it isn't a measure of need. And the EU principle around the structural funds is that you allocate it on the basis of need and you measure need in terms of GDP per capita and Scotland at the moment is pretty much kind of not that much different from England. Wales is, uh, is significantly lower GDP per capita at least in West Wales. Um, so a, a, for the, for, a it's the principle about whether we are going to use need as an indicator or just kind of allocate Scotland some money at the start and then let Scotland use it as it likes. And it, it could, Scotland could have its own uh, indicators of need. And of course, the way that money is, most money is allocated within Scotland is already on the basis of need because all education funding, all local government funding, all health funding takes account of the number of pupils, uh, the uh, levels of disability in the population, uh, uh, and so on. But then there's the, the overall question is, well, should the UK government determine need um, in terms of a global view across the UK economy, which would probably mean perhaps that even more structural fund money would go to Wales uh, and, uh, and, less, uh, and less to Scotland. Uh, or do you just hand over a bunch of cash to the devolved administrations, arguing perhaps that they know best how to deal with their own patch and let them allocate money to the highlands or, or, or to deprived areas in, in Scotland? Uh, you know, there isn't an easy, uh, an easy answer. And again, we actually come back to the governance arguments uh, uh, around that. But, but, you know, again... It's something that, that this is a critical co question that, w that we have to think through uh, in, in the relatively short space of time. Mm -hmm. So we're here. Ivan. Yeah. Thanks. And now that we've um, 
figured out the reverse Barnet squeeze. I just wanted to throw a few more interesting things into the pot to get your, your take on it. Um, clearly, the, the Barnet squeeze depends on relative population growth. Um, although starting from a position where Scotland has uh, got a higher per capita revenue coming in from the from the Barnet formula, if we're in an environment where where we hope to be, um, and which may happen given the, the, the differential actuaries to immigration, where Scotland's population is going faster in percentage terms than the UK's population, clearly that's got an impact on whether your reverse Barnet squeeze is certainly the the, the, the quantum of it, mm -hmm. if if not the direction. Um, and an, an, another issue in there is clearly Barnet isn't the only mechanism for allocating funds. So there is a third kind of option, which is you can invent a new way of doing it, which is effectively what the Fiscal Commission does, because you've got IPC in there, which kind of protects your population growth impact. Um, so there's another way to do that. And then just on top of that, if I'm correct, the more revenue is devolved to Scotland, and let's that could be one that's on the table in a post-EU environment, then um, you're in a situation where the impact of Barnet is smaller because the PGA is bigger um, and it's protected through the IPC, through the fiscal framework, at least until 2021. So if I'm correct, my assumptions there, are just like your take on those. Right, I'll let you think about that. And then, I'll, but while you're thinking about it, I'll let Ian in. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to make a point um, about the issue that David made, which is, is policy effectively best made on one's own patch, and points to the current example of higher education broadly defined, where in each of the four um, nations which uh, make up the United Kingdom, higher education policy has been diverging at some rate, uh, so that within Scotland, we have a very, very different policy to, to, to anywhere else, uh, and that is achieved by the Scottish Government taking a view that it wishes, for example, to fund fees and in research that it wishes to encourage in a Scottish way the interaction between universities and industry to drive the economy. Now, those are made against, as has been said, uh, it could be spent on education, it could be spent on health, it could be spent on any other things. But the bottom line is the Scottish Government is taking decisions about what is best for Scotland on a block grant basis, as opposed to those decisions being taken, for example, in the UK-wide and then having to be enacted across. And I might argue um, that it's working quite well in research uh, at the moment in every way. It's helpful. Johnny? Um, the question from Mirror Fraser was, uh, do we replace EU um, funding with UK-wide approach or do we sort of uh, look at Scotland's share uh, and allocate that through the block grant, the existing block grant approach? Um, our view on this is, is quite clear uh, quite, and quite crude, I guess, but uh, nevertheless, I hope it gets the measure across, uh, the message across. I mean, clearly... CAP funding, particular Pillar 1 funding, comes from the EU, comes to the UK, but then basically goes straight through UK government's hands and into Scottish government's hands, at which point it is also entirely ring-fenced. It cannot be spent on anything else other than agri direct agricultural support and other things as well, and a significant amount of the Pillar 2 rural development funding is of the same ilk. Um, so um, any suggestion to us of you know what the future budget might be that the UK Treasury might uh, allocate to replace current UK CAP funding is key obviously uh, we would argue that it has to be at least the same quantum but thereafter the big question for us is then how it's allocated on a UK wide basis because currently we get 16.3 percent of that UK uh, funding from the CAP uh, which is a significant difference from the Barnet uh, equivalent, which would be about 8 or 9%. Um, so th that immediately sends a few alarm bells ringing. And then the, the second question after that is, no matter, regardless of what the allocation would be to Scotland, is that once it comes into Scotland, would it be ring-fenced? And the point's already been made about, well, where would it have to sit in terms of competition with other things? And we all recognise that there are hugely competing demands on limited public funding. So there are significant um, concerns on our behalf. I'm intrigued by the comment about Barnet not being based on, on uh, uh, need. 
uh, and, I, I, and I think that's absolutely right. And that goes back to the earlier conversation about what our objectives are. Um, given that Scottish agriculture's reliance on agricultural support is significantly different from other parts of the United Kingdom, given the very terrain in which we find ourselves operating, uh, particularly our beef and sheep producers in more marginal areas, which isn't just about food production, it is about sustaining communities and rural development issues and so on. Um, I would argue very strongly that the, the allocation of future funding should be made in a very different way from Barnet. We've got several different criteria which would suggest what that ought to be across the UK. And finally, I guess a, a real concern, and it goes back to this issue of intra-UK agricultural trade or competitive advantage in the sense that if you had a significant change in the current allocations, i.e. you went to barnetized approach, you'd get a, an, and let's assume the Treasury continued to fund to the same extent as, the, as we currently get from the EU, you'd get a rush of funding into, U, into English agriculture, which you could argue doesn't need it, and a rush out of marginal areas in Scotland uh, and possibly Northern Ireland to a degree, but they're in a slightly different place, uh, and certainly parts of Wales. That, at a funding level, might be one thing, but it would almost immediately cause some sort of collapse in particularly our red meat sector. Um, and in a sense, that would put us at a very, very difficult uh, competitive position within the UK agricultural market, let alone anything to do with Europe. And finally, I think one thing we need to uh, recognise in this whole approach is that under the CAP, uh, discussions have already started at a European level about the next programme for the CAP, and there are already suggestions of significant funding cuts to the CAP. So I suspect whatever the Treasury does will probably follow that sort of model at very least, if not go further in some sorts of cuts. So I think that's something we need to be mindful of, is that whatever happens to the CAP is likely to be an influence on decision-making by UK Treasury as well. Okay, Diane, and then for David. I'm not sure whether I'm answering your questions. I think I'm probably just raising, raising more. Um, I think I was invited here uh, as somebody who's got like hands-on experience of actually managing structural funds, so 20 years of experience since the 1997 programme till now. So to be honest, I've seen significant changes in the level of... Sim of information required, the audit process, the bureaucracy and things like that. And we have seen it go to the last stage where we actually received an invoice for the Scottish Government for 16 pence um, because we rounded up two of our invoices in a claim, you know, to the full pound instead of to what. And the, I actually was like, going, I'll just give you out of my pocket because surely that's cheaper. But I think where, we've, where we are coming from as local authorities and as the East of Scotland European Consortium, there are a number of issues that I think needs to be thought about, um, one of which is the match funding issue. You can give us all the money in the world that you want, but if we don't have any match funding, if that's a requirement of actually delivering projects, we can't deliver anything. Um, Aberdeenshire raised it as an issue. They were awarded a, a pot of money for the European Structural Funds for delivering employability programmes. They didn't have the match funding at the level required to to draw down all of that money and they couldn't do it. It was then allocated, a, a, you're talking about need versus opportunity and things as well. They were given a rurality index in terms of what uh, they might need in terms of money to deliver a programme. It meant that they actually, with an unemployment rate of about 3%, were awarded more money for employability than Dundee City Council were awarded um, because we were an urban area and therefore we didn't have that rurality index. So I think you've got to be really careful to look at the need versus opportunity, what level you're looking at it at. It comes from Europe at nuts two level, which is far too large to even address local versus regional disparity. Um, and I think it also then relates to who's actually making the regional policy or the local policy and the, the money needs to follow those levels of opportunity. And the only other thing I wanted to say was that the timing of any replacement funding that comes from the UK government, whether it's to the Scottish government or directly from them, is really critical. And we're not seeing it being developed fast enough at the present point in time. We've only got till 2020 to actually identify what the future is for us. That's very helpful. David, do you want to try and pick up an Ivan's question to you as well at the same time? That sort of general question, if you can still remember what it was, because yeah, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on you go. No, on you go. Oh, sorry, no, no I, well, I, I, was, I was thinking about, about um, areas too, because 
um, we, ha we, ha we probably have to have at a UK level some kind, if we're, we're thinking about how to measure need, we have to kind of probably at the UK level have to an, an agreement about what are the areas so that the areas aren't ger gerrymandered uh, to, uh, to provide the level of need that, um, that, that generates the, uh, the uh, support. The other thing I was going to say, it's not, it's not correct to think that then, if, well, the, the, the Scot Scottish farmer shouldn't be terrified about the Barnet formula in the sense that probably in the first instance, uh, Scotland would get, as, as David said, 16.3% of the funding. Barnet only applies then to the changes and in cash terms, when the money is going down, actually Scotland slightly benefits, as, as I said, in relative terms, and uh, it, it, it will slightly lose out in terms of uh, um, when the cash budget is going up. If the budget isn't changing that much, the 16.3% doesn't change that much. Ian and David. Just very, very quickly. need has been mentioned, can I just make a plea that it is incredibly important that if you are making aerial indices or measures of need that you take into account <coughs> rural areas. Too many measures of need simply take a, a, a multiple deprivation, they're called, approach, and they're heavily biased often towards urban areas. And rural deprivation, which is hidden and important in Scotland, is lost completely. We really do need a sophisticated measure if we're going to measure need. David and then Patrick. Um, yes, so I was going to kind of follow up on, on um, Ivan's uh, couple of questions and some other bits kind of related to that. Um, so first of all, you're right, if there's kind of more rapid population growth, more generally the Barnet formula becomes less advantageous to Scotland because it takes account of population growth for the increment, but not for the baseline funding. Um, and you're right that the IPC method would both avoid the issue about any kind of convergence, either because of population or because of... Um, the, uh, you know, a pounds per head difference is being different as a percentage because it's based on percentages rather than pounds per head. Um, now, coming back to kind of some of the bigger questions, I think there's, we can kind of, I think, separate the issue about whether it's ring-fenced from whether or not it kind of goes via the Barnet formula because you could still have some kind of needs assessment based on certain characteristics, whether it's agricultural need or deprivation and... Um, I guess economic disadvantage, maybe a kind of broader term there, uh, type of need, but yet still give discretion of how that money is spent. So to give an example, it could be that you look at the kind of relative levels of de deprivation or disadvantage economically uh, to decide how much funding to give to Scotland or areas within Scotland, but then the local governments or the Scottish government has discretion on how to spend that because maybe the best way to tackle um, that deprivation is not a traditional economic development type of policy, but maybe it's better social care and better education because that will let people go back into work and improve human capital in the longer term. So I think you can kind of separate out the kind of the way funding levels are determined from what then they have to be spent upon. You know, although I kind of bear in mind that there, there will be issues about whether certain sectors kind of feel they could be squeezed if there's not some kind of ring fencing. And then I think this kind of issue about need, I think if this is a section on um, regional funding kind of in particular, um, with need, currently how need is defined within the UK for local government funding, say, is quite different to how need is defined for EU funding. Need for local government funding is, is, is based on deprivation, if you like, whereas need for EU funding is based on GDP per capita. And actually, the patterns of those differ quite significantly across the country. A lot of the kind of areas with the lowest levels of GDP per capita are rural areas. Um, a lot of the areas with the biggest levels of deprivation, uh, urban areas actually have quite strong overall economies. Um, so I think you need to kind of determine, you know, what, what is it that is need? How progressive should it be according to need? Currently, it's very progressive. Um, and... Um, I think there's, a, there's a, lot, a lot of decisions to be taken there. I probably take up enough time with that no, answer there. I was, I was, if I interrupt your flow, forgive me, I just say, I'm just thinking of, these are big, big questions. We're dealing with the idea of saying that to Adam. I okay, so I, I, sorry, I, I didn't want to take too much time. Saying, so forgive me. Um, but I was saying, I think, you know, at the moment we have this kind of, a, the EU funding is very progressive and it has this big cliff edge in there. So if you're less than 75%, 
you get much more money. That's why West Wales and the Valleys and Cornwall get so much more than somewhere like South Yorkshire and maybe, I guess, some parts of Scotland are just above that threshold as well. Um, and that also gives you the incentive to, gerry to gerrymander as well as, as um, David Bell said. Because if you get just below that threshold, you get three times as much funding. Um, and, you know, that certainly happened in Wales. It's happened in London, actually, as well. You have an inner London and outer London. And outer London is classified, I think, as a, a transition area um, because they've kind of taken all the inner, inner sections out. Um, and I think the, kind of, the last thing I kind of, I'd, I'd raise here um, is, as well as thinking about kind of need, what role is there for outcomes and what role is there for competition in the bidding? Because I don't understand it. Compet kind of within local areas, there is competition over projects. Kind of what happens is kind of projects apply and there's some kind of, um, not necessarily kind of formal competitive tendering, but it's almost they, they judge the cost benefits of different policies and decide which ones to fund on some kind of criteria. But at the kind of regional level, there's, there's no such, it's based on needs measures. Would there be some scope or some role for uh, an outcomes or competitiveness to be taken into account at that level as well? I'm not saying yes or no, but that is a kind of an important decision because that is how city deals, for instance, have an element of that in there, or growth fund deals. It does in a way as well because it's a bit of competition for resources. So. Very quick point, uh, at the risk of that's, I, am, I am disagreeing. Um, <laughs> but, but too often we are engaging our discussions around need in a historical way because the data only allowed us to look at a big area and so we have to worry about how do we make this big area. We have all the ability using now data which are, which are available from administrative sources, from other sources, at a very, very local level to take local levels of need and build them up in whatever way you want to in a way which does not get in contact in the problems that you get uh, if you take a big area and then you, you lose people and have cliff edges. It's not rocket science. It's perfectly possible, and Scotland is better than just about anywhere else at doing it. That's a strong point. Patrick? Um, thank you. I, I kind of hesitate to make this even more complicated. Um, once upon a time, not so very long ago, we basically just had the Barnet formula and people thought that was complicated enough. Uh, and then we built on top of that a fiscal framework to deal with the devolution of tax and social security and other, other issues in the most recent Scotland Act. And that is another uh, level of, of complexity. Uh, and that's due to be reviewed under the agreement between the Scottish and UK governments by 2020, 2021, um, with recommendations for, for change coming to, to the end of that period. Now, that may or may not be at the end of what seems like quite a stretchy transition period in, in European terms, but is there a danger that if we, if we have that process and the design of new funding mechanisms that may or may not themselves be based on Barnet, <coughs> if we have these things in isolation, we'll make a mess of both? Point. And and how, how much of a, a challenge is, is trying to combine those two together? <laughs> Emma? It's a quick point, actually. Um, cool. Thank you, convener. Um, last time David Mundell, Secretary of State, was here, he said that the farming would not be um, barnetised. So I'm wondering if that suggests that he's ahead of the game and some other... Um, fiscal framework will be set up that will be completely separate because obviously Scotland has a disproportionate um, need for support um, for our rural economy and 73% uh, of the land in Scotland is agricultural holdings and we have 85% less favoured areas so we do need a different solution for the way um, things are um, I guess looked at for Scotland so okay. Several points I want to pick up on. I, I want to reiterate David's point about uh, it, capture the money now rather than uh, put it over to competition elsewhere. So put it in the block grant and then work with Barnet. Would seem to me a simple way and picks up Patrick's point about why come up with a new system when Barnet already exists and whether you like it or not, it does actually has worked. Um, 
The idea that you would then develop or think about whether it should be ring fenced or not, I think that's a really, really important issue that needs to be debated. Agriculture is important, but it's not as important as other sectors in the in the UK economy for growth purposes. Clearly important for rurality and rural sustainability. Are we funding agriculture for its rural sustainability purposes, or are we are we funding agriculture for its growth, trade, uh, uh, economic benefits? The the debates needs to be had rather than just assume we continue with the ring fencing of agriculture as is, because we don't do that for any other industry. Um, and my other point would be around setting up a needs approach. Um, extremely difficult to do. Um, and if you open up this level of funding to a needs assessment, what do you do to the rest of the Barnet formula? You open it up to a needs assessment, because certainly Wales would argue that the Barnet formula isn't fair for them on a needs assessed basis. So opening up needs on this, I think, is a leverage for the rest of the block grant. I can feel a Welsh one coming in here. <laughs> David. Um, Yes, so uh, following on from what Emma Harper said, I think you're right that it's unlikely for agriculture, certainly, uh, that Barnet um, is going to be uh, used. Um, kind of the, the, the talk about kind of uh, using it for public goods purposes, you know, well, if it's going to be used for public goods purposes, um, there's, there's, no ne there's no necessarily relation between you know, the kind of size of the public goods that can be delivered versus the size of um, a population. Say, if Scotland has you know potential for more public goods to be delivered because of its kind of you know larger rural landscape and you know historic degradations of f kind of farmland and moorland and forests, maybe there's more scope for public goods and therefore Scotland should get a much bigger than population share and that should be increasing more if Scotland's doing more to deliver on those things. I think you're right. The kind of the the, the rhetoric as well suggests that Barnet wouldn't be kind of used there. I think you know more generally. I think. Um, you know, kind of the, the point that, that Joe raises about, um, first of all, um, would this open up debates about um, needs being used uh, more widely to replace Barnet? Well, certainly Wales would try to use that as leverage, I'm sure, but the Scottish government uh, would certainly kind of push back against that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it really would kind of... I'm not sure Wales has kind of greater leverage on this issue than the Scottish government would have. So I'm not sure it really would kind of be a threat, if you like, to Scotland's relatively high levels of funding under the current arrangements. Um, I do think, though, that the Barnet formula, you know, applying Barnet to, um, say, development funding would have big, big impacts on uh, Wales, for instance. Um, and I'm not just saying that as a Welshman, um, but it would have a, big, it, it would have a, a very uh, large impact on Wales. And I think for that reason, it, it is quite unlikely to kind of just go simplify the Barnet formula because, you know, currently um, re uh, regional development funding is about six times per capita higher in Wales uh, than in England. Um, and the kind of Barnet squeeze we'd get on that, you know, in a few years that would come down, you know, 600 to 400 to 300. And I think because of the, the size of that squeeze, it would, it, would, it would be politically very challenging for the government uh, to, to, to roll that into to Barnet and it not to be seen as, you know, penalising the kind of the, the poorest region of the UK. Okay, that's just, sorry, Amanda. I might I'd just like to pick up on a couple of the points, really. Firstly, the measuring need is incredibly difficult in rural, and we've learned through LEADER and other programmes that SAMD just isn't fit for purpose. And although there's some efforts to try and look at how, how we can measure that, there are problems within rural communities themselves about measuring it. Things to do with privacy um, and shame, really, that people do not come forward. And we've seen this, whether it's with rural homelessness or rural poverty, these issues are hidden and very difficult for us to use as metrics. So I, I just wanted to flag that up again. And the other thing is we, we tend to think about CAP as farm payments. And I think this comes to Joe's point about rural sustainability, because the money that those farmers or agriculture receives doesn't just sit on the farm. It trickles through the rural economy and helps provide jobs and livelihoods for a lot of people in rural communities. And so I think that's really important. And when you take that together with LEADER, which is the other source of funding for a lot of rural communities to put together projects, whether they're... Um, about the rural economy and creating jobs or whether they're looking at the social aspects of rural life. 
leader has the advantage of additionality. And in a lot of places, it's used to bring other external money into the rural economy. So rural communities really feel like they're being hit everywhere at the moment. The farm payments are going. They won't be able to use leader money for match funding. And it actually then start needs, means that we have to take another look at community benefit funds because most of those have got clauses in them that insist on communities finding some form of match funding, um, which is very few and, far, there was few and far between the opportunities. So I just wanted to cover that off. Can I just add very quickly to that? In that, um, you know, for, for every, roughly for every pound that Scottish agriculture receives in direct, <coughs> direct support, uh, Scottish agriculture through farmers and crofters is then spending uh, about five pounds thirty. So it's a multiplier of about five uh, in terms of cost. Now, not all of that is getting spent in local economies, but an awful lot is, and it sustains a whole host of upstream suppliers, uh, trades, businesses, and so on, hauliers, vets, contractors, you name it, and it filters right throughout the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Scottish local economy and full economy. But then downstream, I think the other point is, is key. Yes, agriculture in its own right isn't a huge employer, 65,000 full-time jobs. Uh, it's not a huge part of the, the, the Scottish economy, as if you look at it in isolation. But in terms of its then contribution to uh, Scotland's food and drink sector, which is significant in terms of employment and uh, importance to the overall economy, um, then it is the, it's, it's the producer of the primary product and then what we do with that and Scottish government has an existing target of growing the food and drink sector from a turnover of 14 and a half billion per year to 30 billion a year by uh, 2030 and I suspect it'll fall far short of that if we don't keep an eye on how funding is allocated to agricultural businesses uh, but equally, I'm also saying that agricultural businesses aren't just about food production. It's about everything else they do in terms of local community, local economy and managing our environment. Now, the, the next section we're going to have a discussion about was agricultural funding. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're already gone a fair bit down that area. I don't have any, in terms of the agricultural funding issue, do we want to, any other comments on it or any other could questions? I, on you go. Could, could I just add to that last comment? I, I mean, I think it's perfectly... <laughs> defensible to, to argue that, that uh, agricultural funding is there to support the provision of public goods, which are mainly about environmental improvement and also about sustaining rural communities. But going right back to the, the start of the, um, the uh, uh, discussion uh, in terms of governance of all of this, um, the UK government won't want to be in a trade negotiation where, where uh, uh, the other side, the US, Canada, whoever, is saying, well, nothing much is going on in England, but you're supporting the incomes of farmers in Scotland, and we will use that in a sense against you in terms of these trade negotiations. Now, the, the way that, that um, agriculture is currently be, being supported is probably uh, allowable under WTO rules. So it's not supporting the production. It's, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's uh, de-linked from food production. But nevertheless, you know, um, the Scottish government will have to, A, make a, a good case about how it supports agriculture, and B, be in a position to, to um, uh, in a sense, participate, help the UK government when it's in these trade negotiations, because these are, you know, the, the, these are going to be apparently uh, many of these are going to occur uh, within a relatively short time now. Yeah, David, uh, I have a question actually. Um, do we know how much of the land for agriculture in Scotland is rented as opposed to owned by the farmers? Because you might expect that um, agricultural subsidies could get capitalised into land values so that ultimately the beneficiary of the, of the subsidy is not uh, the farmer, but whoever owns the farming land. Um, so I wondered... If it's you know, and if, if, if that is the own, if the farmer is the owner, then it is the farmer that's benefiting. Um, but if if not, 
uh, it could actually be there's a bunch of, you know, lads kind of living it up. I mean, in, in, in terms of tenanted ten, ten agricultural land is, is about, the ballpark figure is about 30%, but that, that land is, is uh, let in a whole host of different arrangements, be it secure tenancies or even just annual grass lets, for farmer to farmer, letting a field here and there. Uh, but to make a, an assumption about agricultural support being capitalised into land values is absolutely right. That's happened since the, uh, the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1870-whatever. Uh, uh, Ricardo's theory of rent, uh, the price of corn is not high because rents are high, but vice versa. And that's exactly the same today. And that is an absolutely clear and unequivocal flaw of the common agricultural policy, in, in our opinion, in my opinion, is that an area-based payment with ha has no reflection on how you farm, uh, but it's about occupation of land is simply, uh, you know, and the occupation of land being the means to unlock a payment is a very, very blunt, crude and uh, inefficient way of supporting an agricultural industry or indeed deriving environmental benefits or anything else. So we want to see a move away from the CAP and how CAP payments are made. Um, but the challenge, as quite uh, pointed out by David, is that once you move away from a, a very decoupled area-based payment is that you Depending on how you do that, you could then be challenged in terms of other trading partners to say you're directly supporting production. Well, we think we've got solutions to say, well, it's not about directly supporting production. It's about not tons of wheat or head, head of cattle that you've got, but indeed how, how you manage your land. And that's one of the arguments that DEFRA will be using in terms of if, if they're paying farmers for the delivery of public benefit or driving productivity gains rather than production, which again is something we would say is the right direction, then we think we can overcome that. Um, the CAP, without question, in my opinion, has incentivised inertia in Scottish agriculture. Uh, and we have, we have, for the last 45 years, farmed in a way to unlock a payment rather than what the market wants or indeed what society wants. And we believe that this is now the opportunity to move away from that. But we need to move away from that very carefully. We're not saying we should reduce the amount of funding that goes into Scottish agriculture. Far from it. But it's how we spend it on Scottish agriculture which has to change. And I think that, that's the, the clear distinction. But the, the CAP has is, is, is long been ready for reform. And arguably, uh, you know, Brexit is a catalyst to move that process on very, very quickly. Um, but obviously avoiding cliff edges for our more vulnerable uh, beef and sheep producers in particular in certain areas because they need to manage that change process. And Scottish Government ourselves and other administrations are in that, in that same view and in that same vein. This is going to be a difficult and challenging time. Uh, we want to get to the place where we have clear objectives of what we want farmers to do and how we will support them. But nevertheless, you know, we cannot race to that very quickly. Otherwise, the collateral damage could be significant in terms of rural areas, rural economy, uh, and so on. Thank you, George. Quite helpful. Uh, 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 and this committee is actually about to undertake a, a more substantial piece of work on common frameworks and what they look like, what they feel like, how they're negotiated. And all of that you've just described is obviously going to be in front of our minds as we, as we look at what, that, what these arrangements are going to look like. Joe, I saw you nodding your head away no. vigorously there no. about things. In, agree Alexa in agreement. In agreement. Alexander, do you want to pick up anything at, at this stage? Yeah, my, my question is really the, the WTO point, which I think has already been, been covered um, very well. Um, but Jonathan also mentioned the next round of cap. I just wondered, is that, is the early indications, is that going to go the same way uh, as where we think the WTO is going in terms of you know, moving away from production uh, support? I, th I think that the direction of travel at a European level uh, in terms of the CAP uh, really shifted on a, a gear in 2005 with the decoupling of payments and then in 2013 uh, that being taken a step further with the introduction of things like greening measures in Pillar 1. Uh, the, I can't see the direction of travel changing at a European level uh, at all. Uh, I think it will continue down that route and, and the, the, a major proposal coming out of those early discussions and papers from the Commission is that they are looking at the capping of, of, of payments to individual businesses. This is par partly a budget management issue because the CAP is a huge expenditure issue for Europe and it's also about how you rebalance funding from p perhaps the old member states of Western 
EU, the Germany's, the France, France's, the Spain's, etc., uh, with with the newer member states and how we move to this more uh, converged level of payments across uh, what will be 27 member states once the UK leaves. So that, that's the broad direction of travel. But built into that will be an increasing expectation of farmers uh, delivering more in terms of public good as at the same time producing food uh, of a standard and a quality and with traceability and all the rest of it around that as well. Do okay, you think we've covered agriculture adequ adequately? Is anybody got any other points you want to make? Because I'd like to make sure. We'll get you. Very, very I do hope that when we take those on board, that we move to a system of funding which incentivizes both agricultural production and environmental protection, um, because that can be done. And there was a very good piece of work that the Economic and Social Research Council about 10 years ago evaluated, which showed how incentivizing farmers to reduce the impact on the environment worked very well and that I think could be seen as part of what Jonathan was saying about the public good so that making it a more complex a little more complex in the um, goals but those which impact not only on agricultural production but on environmental protection seems to me to be a good thing and that might help with that, that might help with WTO rules as well so direction of travel we see in in that uh, we believe that, that the future is not about area-based support direct income support if you like but about combining improvements in productivity with in tackling the big issues around the environment in terms of climate change water quality and biodiversity but those two things not being separate uh, and parallel exercises which they have been to date but actually very very complementary overlapping so uh, the more efficient you are in your production system the less input use, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are win-wins, to use a cliche, all over the place, but we just haven't grasped them, and, and now we have an opportunity to do that. So that's the, we've already produced proposals that would, uh, that would uh, try and bring that into play uh, and mainstream that as how agriculture should be supported. Okay, good. Now, we're moving into areas of research funding now, and Willie, I think you are going to kick that area off, and I know, Ian, you might have to go about... Okay, fine. Too much fun. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is actually good fun. I'm learning so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, well, Chris. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, turning to research funding, we know that um, research funding put through things like Horizons is worth about 80 billion euros over the period up to 2020. And our universities in Scotland have been particularly successful in this area, winning research funding, gaining about 11%, we think, of the UK allocation of these funds. So what do you think will be the impact so on, on Scotland, on Scottish universities and others, the consequences if we no longer have access to that funding stream in Europe? Because presumably the UK has a decision to be to make about whether it will continue contributing to, to that fund to allow uh, Scottish universities to apply for the funding. So what do you think of the implications of it if, if the funding stream is, is, is withdrawn? Uh, well, I think the first thing to say is that um, in the Prime Minister's Jodrell Bank speech, she was very, very clear that it is the wish of the UK government to remain part of the European funding stream. Now, that requires negotiations that... Uh, I certainly am not able to comment on at all, uh, but I do think that throughout the discussions there has been a consistent view um, that we would wish to be uh, to remain part of the European research enterprise, not least, I believe, because um, European research is much better with the UK being part of it because of the UK's strength in uh, research than the UK not being part of it. So I do believe without in any way trying to sound arrogant on behalf of the UK, that Europe needs the UK in research as much as the UK would like to be part of the, the European research um, enterprise. Scotland is extremely good at competing for those funds, and indeed Scotland uh, outperforms in percentage of, of population uh, other parts of the UK. Now. So, so having said that, your question was, well, what happens if the wishes that have been made thus far um, do not happen? Uh, and 
um, we as a, a nation do not have access to those funds. Um, clearly, it would then be for um, the UK as a whole to decide how much funding to, to allocate to research. And I think it is worth saying that the current UK government has um, increased the funding for research and innovation by seven billion pounds in this parliament. Uh, and I would expect Scottish uh, higher education to be very successful in bidding for, for much of that fund. So there is already a, a commitment to research and innovation that exists. I would hope that if we were not um, able to access European funds, there would be an increase in, f in funds. And then I would expect that Scottish universities would continue um, to outperform, um, or at least to do very, very well in, in the, com the competition that exists. If there was such uh, an increase, then I think it is important to recognise that um, enshrined in legislation in the Higher Education Act of, of the UK of last year is the dual support system that I described earlier, and that would lead to, and so an increase in funding would lead to an increase in the block grant to the Scottish Government, and the Scottish Government would then have the ability to take whatever decisions it wanted to take uh, about funding um, research, the, the block grant part of that, uh, within Scotland. The only point I would then further make, though, is that whereas in the 17th century, shall we say, research was done by individual scholars locked away in garrets uh, for very long periods of time, um, research these days, particularly on the big challenges that the world face, is undertaken by multidisciplinary teams, uh, and multidisciplinary teams, uh, because knowledge knows no nation-state boundaries that cut across nation-states. Uh, and so we would need to uh, find ways to enable uh, the best researchers uh, in Scotland to be able to collaborate effectively with the best researchers elsewhere in order to really be able to address some of the magnificently difficult uh, but important problems in research that the world faces. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to follow on from what uh, Ian Diamond was saying. Um, I think kind of, in, in part because of the kind of collaborating, collaboration it kind of opens up, but also because not only is Scotland kind of better than the UK on average in terms of its success rates, but better in, the UK is better than the EU in terms of its success rates. So it's kind of, you know, performing well within a country that's performing well. Um, there, there could be benefits kind of financially and in terms of research collaboration from remaining in EU-wide schemes, so in, within Horizon 2020, within the Re European Research Council, etc. Um, that will require a contribution uh, from the UK into the EU. I think the rules are somewhat different for non-EU members, I think, in terms of setting the priorities for what that research um, stream looks like. So I think there would be... Um, uh, be, being outside of the EU, I think it's the case you don't have quite as much influence on kind of the the design and allocation of those Horizon 2020 funding as if you were kind of a full member of the EU. But kind of finance and, and that could have imp implications for um, how much funding you get back if kind of it, it then shifts towards funding priorities that other universities and other countries have comparative advantage in. But you'd still expect to get more than a kind of, if, if, if the contribution is based on population or GDP, you'd expect to get more than that back unless there was quite a substantial um, changing of priorities uh, and changing of allocations post-Brexit to the UK and to Scotland. Um, if you can't be in the uh, EU schemes, I think there's then a question about actually, you know, how much of that funding comes back and be is allocated at a UK-wide level through, uh, say, the research councils, like ESRC, the Physical Research Council, etc., versus how much of that goes uh, into the block grant to be allocated by, you know, the higher research education, so the higher education and research bodies of Scotland, Wales, uh, England, and Northern Ireland. Um, 
I'm not sure if there's any kind of like set proportions that are set by this act uh, that was mentioned. But again, I guess there could be a trade-off between you know how much control does the Scottish government have on the kind of priorities uh, over how that money is spent. Clearly, it has more control if it is mostly allocated to the Scottish government to allocate as part of its research funding, versus scope potentially for collaboration and scope for you know getting a, above a population share, kind of a higher share than your population, if it's at a competitive level at the UK level. And there are also then decisions about what kind of criteria should be used to allocate that, that funding. Is it just based on just pure quality of the research proposals, or are there other objectives that have been trying to be met by this funding? So, for instance, you know, would this funding be partly seen as being an element of regional policy where not only is it aimed at supporting innovation, but it's aimed at supporting innovation in more deprived or less advantaged areas? I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but in effect, you can kind of see being in the EU gives the most scope for kind of collab being in the EU. Um, research programs because the most sort of collaboration and potentially the highest levels of funding if the kind of degree of um, success uh, uh, was to be sustained through to devolving down Scotland would give the Scottish government the most control about the objectives and the type of uh, research and innovation that, that, that funding goes towards. Just worth saying, I'm going to respond. Two points there. The first is that um, Scotland has always been clear that it sees the competitive nature of funding across the UK as being desirable and there is considerable evidence to demonstrate that the UK's competitive funding scheme has actually led to the UK being uh, one of the very best countries in the world uh, for uh, research and, and part of that has always been based on the view that it is excellence that um, is um, the key thing and one of the things that has been said about our potential participation in European funding post uh, Brexit is that we would wish it, we would wish funding still to be based on excellence, and it is on excellence that we believe uh, that one uh, can, can can do very well. And the other point I just wanted to make was uh, I deliberately didn't talk about. Um, third country models because I could be here for three days talking about different third country models for participation in European research funding. The Norwegian model, the Swiss model, the Israeli model, we could continue. They are all different and it does seem to me um, that this is one area where uh, if both parties wish to um, participate and certainly the UK view uh, and I would submit that of Scotland is that we do. Um, then there needs to be a sensible conversation about how best to ensure both excellence and influence. So uh, it, quite a lot has been said about the, the flows of funds. I just want to make a quick point about the flows of people. Um, I think it, it's really important that, um, uh, yes, we, we, we can try to... Uh, um, organize some kind of deal in relation to Horizon 2020, but it is it has been vitally important for higher education institutions in the UK and in Scotland to also have the people from Europe coming across, spending time here, um, and, uh, you know, that kind of interaction, which, which Ian was talking about, it, it develops, uh, helps develop excellent uh, research. I am one of only three British people in my department, only two Scottish people. Um, and, you know, we do benefit from all of the international linkages that having people from Mexico, from, uh, from Belgium, from wherever uh, within the department, and that helps the research in itself, uh, aside from any funding issues. Responded about research, but given David's, I think, very helpful interjection, could I also say that some of those European or indeed other scholars, but some of those European scholars now in David's department may have first come uh, on an Erasmus uh, undergraduate visit uh, to spend a semester in Scotland. Uh, and I do think we need to recognise that encouraging, as the Scottish Government has always done, encouraging both Scots students to spend a semester outside of Scotland and to encourage European students to continue to study in Scotland, which is good not only for the short term, but the long term benefit uh, of higher education in Scotland is incredibly important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I just had, had three really quick things, and one of them relates to what Sir Ian Diamond was saying about the um, the sort of third model, third country models. Whatever model we end up with, we're only likely to get out what we put in. So we won't, as a UK, gain more money from Europe as we are now. We still have an opportunity as Scotland, obviously, to try and gain more money out of the, the UK pot, but it really is what you put in is what you get out. That it's you know you'd have to have a really difficult negotiation to try and get any further. I think um, one of the other points that was raised was about the future programmes and how we um, engage and how what those priorities are. And I think it's just uh, safe to say that we are still in the negotiations at the present point in time, and many of the programmes for the next multi-annual framework are being developed right now, and we need to make sure that our sort of um, priorities are put into those programmes because they will be there for the next seven years, regardless of whether we are there or not. Um, and I think finally, it talks about the research and about the people in Erasmus and Horizon 2020, but there are a whole host of other transnational programmes out there that are really not being talked about. The universities have a very powerful lobby in terms of you know, Horizon 2020 and, and Erasmus, but from a local authority perspective, we engage in um, research, sort of hands-on research through a whole host of other programmes, particularly interreg um, programmes that allow us to actually learn from best practice and experience elsewhere in Europe and allow us to do the same things that universities do through Horizon 2020 and Erasmus, and it's not really being talked about at that sort of national level at the moment as well, as strongly. Yeah, I wonder if you just tease that a wee bit more around mm -hmm. what Interreg is and what other programmes like that the local authorities are involved in, because I think it would probably help everyone to understand a bit more. Yeah. So Interreg is a structural fund, it's an inter-regional collaboration programme, so it's one of the ones where you go in and you have anywhere between three and 13 partners normally across Europe. Most of them are about um, sort of us learning from best practice or us exchanging experience and collaborating. Um, you develop new policies as a result of these programmes. We are involved in a couple at the moment, one which has been running, it's called Create Converge. We are the lead partner in that, that programme. And it's very much looking at how digital industries and in the sort of film, games and sector can use their skills to develop other economic sectors. So how you might use filming underwater to help develop the oil and gas industry, for example. So it's, a, it's about convergence of those industries. Um, and we've got other partners in, um, in a program looking at cultural tourism and creative tourism, which is just about to start. So for us as a, a city who are about to start developing, hopefully a stronger tourism product, these types of participations and learning from others about how they've done it are really, are really key. So Interreg um, is one, there are lots of others that we've engaged in, in the past that probably have, are gonna be rolled into sort of bigger programs in the future, sort of Intelligent Energy Europe, the Urbact program, which is the only program in the, in the EU that focuses solely on urban issues. So there's these sorts of programs that, that we have participated in and would like to still be able to because from an local government perspective, they're much easier for us to access than programmes such as Horizon 2020. Very helpful. Um, okay, in research areas, is, are, are we, I think we've, we've teased enough of that out. Oh, David, you got another point to make before just, I move just on? Just one, to one very quick point. It comes to kind of collaboration, and it was, um, if we aren't in the EU scheme, which obviously I think the kind of consensus is it's, it's good to be in that scheme, um, it would be kind of uh, worthwhile um, both the Scottish kind of funding body and the UK funding bodies doing more to kind of set up collaborative kind of programs with other research bodies, whether that is with the ERC and with other organisations or directly with individual country ones. So, for instance, ESRC has collaborations with the equivalents in um, uh, Netherlands, Germany, France called the Open Research Area. And they are really successful in bringing teams together. And, you know, as a fallback option, you know, kind of pushing forward that side of things would be you know, kind of potentially very, very uh, beneficial. Could I just say that I completely agree with that, and I do think uh, one would then need to be, I think, quite imaginative, and I think Scotland, for example, could join uh, with the Nordfisk uh, collaboration of the Scandinavian countries. There, you know, one would need, it, it's not optimal, but one would need to um, be imaginative and think laterally and work quickly. <coughs> Another good session. Thank you very much. Structural funds, although they've touched on it a fair bit, James, but I think there's probably still a bit more to tease out there. So. Yeah, uh, I, th I think there's been a there's been a lot of discussion on this already. Um, I was going to ask about match funding, but I think Diane and both Amanda made some really good and practical points around that. Uh, and I suppose uh, again, there's been a lot of discussion around the how funds are allocated. You know, the role of the block grant. 
uh, uh, and the, the Barnet pot formula and some of the different iterations around that, which obviously apply around structural funds. I suppose to you know, kind of bring it all together and to give it a bit of focus, the, the current tranche of uh, structural funds uh, coming to the UK is 10.8 billion euros, of which Scotland gets 476 million euros. Uh, and I suppose the issue going forward is uh, how do we ensure that uh, Scotland protects and ensures a fair and adequate level of funding uh, in, 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 in relation to what will, will replace the, the structural funds and how that uh, how we deal with the kind of competing bids that are going to go on uh, within the UK. Okay, can is that's quite helpful. That sort of brings us back to the beginning, in a sense, in terms of the governance issues that we talked at the beginning. So, David, do you want to have a go at that? Okay. Yes. Um, so, I think you're right there. Kind of the kind of one of the first kind of questions need to be taken. Um, I suppose by the UK government, but I'm sure the kind of Scottish government and the other devolved governments and local government will want kind of a say in this as well. Is at what level uh, kind of strategic objectives? and the kind of broad structures of this programme uh, being uh, defined. Is that going to be a UK sort of framework, you know, this regional prosperity fund? Um, how detailed in terms of its kind of rules and objectives and aims is that going to be? Um, or is it going to be kind of uh, a kind of simply just assessing what kind of, is that just going to be kind of assessing what kind of the level of funding to give to each area is and then it is kind of complete discretion within areas and how to spend it so for instance is this kind of if you like a needs assessment like you have for local government to determine the local government grants and the local government can spend it on what it wants or is it more like um how we it's commonly done for eu projects where you have an assessment at, at, at a um kind of regional level and then it has to be kind of defined spent on kind of particularly quite defined areas to do with I guess labour markets, personal development on one hand, and kind of competitiveness, um, greening, and um, t um, communications. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think um, yeah, on the other hand, so kind of the, the two the two main strands of, of regional uh, funding. Um, and I think once you kind of made made that decision, then there is a question then about you know a whole a whole bunch of questions about you know first of all how kind of granular is is the kind of uh, assessment of needs. So I think kind of Diane mentioned that she thought at the moment it was kind of currently at a too high a level approach and that doesn't kind of pick up pockets of deprivation. Well, is this funding about picking up pockets of deprivation or is it about kind of thinking about broad, is it about broader areas in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, the Highlands and Islands because they are kind of more remote, do they have the same opportunities as the central belt, which is which is less remote and has more scope for agglomeration effects. So kind of thinking, is it about deprivation or is it about broad economic kind of city region type uh, issues? And then there's, you know, well, once you've designed, determined what it's about, how, how targeted should the funding be um, is the next question. And then how frequently should you update that funding? So if you update the funding on a regular basis to account for changes in local characteristics, well, actually, you can end up reducing the incentives that areas have to improve the economies. Because if after five years you say, well, we're going to reduce your funding now because you've got richer, could that be having a negative effect? On the other hand, if you don't update it, you can have an area that really falls down because, you know, some big kind of factories and industries close down, but you've not updated the funding to reflect this is now a more needy area. So there's a kind of a trade-off to think about there. Um, so in my kind of submission, I had a kind of a, a list of questions. And I think, you know, a lot of those questions are, they are the kind of key ones to think about. And some of those will be thought about at a UK level, but depending on how much discretion the Scottish government has, a lot of those will come down to the Scottish government to, to, to be thinking about and be things that the kind of committee would, 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 would kind of want to think about, you know, kind of the, the key questions on, you know, how to target, how targeted should it be, how frequently should you update it, how much discretion, um, and then, you know, evaluation and, 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 and basing an outturn. So, for instance, if you haven't met your previous objectives, should you get less funding going forwards? So there's dozens of questions in this area, which I think we've touched upon, but at some stage we'll have much more debate. But David and then Ian. Uh, 
just to, I mean, uh, I think this does go back uh, uh, right to the start, and and in a sense, uh, I mean, I think perhaps um, it, it's good to think about in this in the context of the UK industrial strategy and the way that that has gone and 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 is developing, and and in a sense, it's partly about equity and it's partly about efficiency, and I think that when it was initially uh, uh, dreamt up, the um, uh, ideas that largely lay behind the industrial strategy were ones around efficiency, getting growth as, as quickly as possible. Then the Prime Minister noticed that there were lots of left behind areas uh, and we're now sort of rebalancing it a bit with the discussion of the shared prosperity fund but it's not really clear how it will be allocated. So this, the, the stuff around um, uh, improving efficiency We've had the city deals, which are meant to engender uh, at a local level. Whether it'll be interesting to have these evaluated ex post, but um, uh, uh, and and quite a lot of stuff around sectoral that's aimed at sectors like the automotive sector. Some of, the, of that of that kind of work has been quite successful, and also then bringing uh, research and innovation into the uh, industrial strategy. Um, and then this sits somewhat oddly with the existing structural funds where money is paid out because you are able to prove you, that in, in some sense you, ha you, ha you are deprived. And the question is then, well, this may be equitable, but is this an efficient use of, uh, uh, an efficient use of funding? And uh, there's all the question that, that David, as, assuming that maybe you don't care too much about the, the efficiency aspects of it, but you are really concerned about equity, how do you determine who to give it to, how much to give it, how much to give that community or, wh or however you define uh, the area? And all of that is up for grabs. We've, we, uh, as, as David has already said, you, you've... The existing model, partly because of the cliff edge nature of the 75% of GDP, doesn't sets up all probably a lot of wrong incentives. Um, so, the shared prosperity fund, I think, is out for consultation at the moment. Um, but there, are, you know, we we're largely in the dark about the quantum of resource that's going to it and and exactly how it's going to be designed. It's kind of important that these issues are addressed, uh, and and perhaps some something quite explicit around this issue of well, we're make, you know this is equity to try to get these left behind areas to catch up uh, with with the rest of the country, and how much is about driving economic growth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I just pick up three points? The first one that David has just made: you know, left behind areas uh, are really important. But those left behind areas are often, for example, fading seaside towns, which may be quite close to good economic areas, but have lost their economy. And I, I make that example because they're not large economic areas. And to come to David's point about, well, things change, well, actually, we are in a position in Scotland in particular, but in the UK as a whole, where we can use data now at a much more granular level and we can do it in real time better than just about anywhere else. So therefore it is wrong in my view to continue to use big areas um, and to um, say we're going to keep this going for five years. We can be much more flexible. However, wouldn't it be really, really, really nice if there was an algorithm that told us exactly how to answer all the questions that David exactly and beautifully put. And sadly, there isn't. That's why we've got politicians, because these, these are... These are, these are, that, these are gonna, in my was, view... I thought it was for you guys to sort no, of... No, I'm sorry, sorry. We can identify the questions, and we can identify the data, and we can provide the evidence. But at the end of the day, it is a political decision, and that's why your job's harder than mine, um, to be able to make those kind of judgments about how much money, about what the priorities are, uh, and how they're going to be allocated, that the research community can provide you with the evidence. You've got a harder job. You make the decisions. Joe. Sure. <laughs> I'm not going to make it any easier, I'm afraid. Um, I, feel, I feel quite uh, aged sitting here thinking through some of the issues that I discussed or was involved in 
when I worked in the Scottish Development Agency, economic development issues, and they are absolutely germane, I think, to the discussion about this new fund or funding arrangements. It's the issue, issues of additionality and displacement. Because if we spend money that we are taking from taxpayers in places that would otherwise happen, that's not net good. And if we're spending money in areas that are displacing from a continuous, contiguous area, that's equally not good. However, additionality and displacement are not easy matters to discuss or debate, particularly when you've got a target to get money out the door to make sure it gets spent. But I would argue that really, really needs to be part of any debate about how we're allocating funding under any new funding arrangement for this type of approach. That then begs the question about is it a UK level, a Scottish level, or a regional level, or a sub-regional level, as apparently we can now do with the data. Not easy, not easy at a UK level, let alone the Green Book shows that, let alone looking at it at a sub-regional level. But if we're talking about good governance, if we're talking about why we're spending the money that we're taking from taxpayers, that we have to start asking those sorts of questions and have some clarity around how we're going to arbitrate against one area getting money or one sector getting money or one region getting money. And then I come back to the third, and even probably the more difficult one is around the issue of those areas that are left behind. Those areas I've left behind, if we start talking about what they are now, they've been left behind when I worked in the SDA. So to make a difference, it's not about turning the tap on and turning the tap off when the data start to tell us something. It's about thinking about why they've been left behind, how long it's going to take, and having the commitment to make that long-term commitment last. Thanks, Joe. Ivan? Yeah, I just wanted a, a couple of observations on, on the discussion and the issue around about economic efficiency versus left behind. And I think, I mean, there's a separate issue about agglomeration and where you focus city deal money, but I mean, leaving that to one side, the um, the, the, the growth reports, uh, commission reports big on this, which is the inclusion agenda, um, because those things needn't necessarily be opposites. If you're focusing the money where you are going to drive inclusion and participation, that's a huge boost to the economy as a whole, so just making the point that they needn't be opposite to each other, depending on how it's configured. Okay, does anybody else want to make an input before we come to a natural conclusion? I think we've come to that natural conclusion. Well, uh, from, from, from my perspective, and I'm sure for the rest of the committee members, that's been an excellent morning. There's been some fantastic input across the room. There's a lot of learning going on. Although turning politicians into algorithms is going to be an interesting, <laughs> yeah. an interesting one to really learn at the end of the day. It's obviously complex, it's challenging, it's compelling in many ways as some of the stuff we've been discussing. It's time pressured. Um, but I think we'll just leave the last word to Ian Diamond who said it's also fun. So <laughs> thank you for everybody for coming along today. It's been most appreciative in helping us in our deliberations. Thank you very much. And now suspend this particular part of the proceedings. Um, to allow for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, we're back uh, after suspension. Uh, our next piece of business is to consider subordinate legislation relating to the land and buildings transaction tax. Uh, we're joined for this item by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution and supporting officials, Ewan Cameron Nielsen and St John Sinclair of the Scottish Government. And as we must consider each such instrument separately, we'll have a short evidence session on each instrument before formal consideration of the relevant motion. Firstly, we'll take evidence on the Lands and Building Transaction Tax Group Relief Modification Scotland Order 2018. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary to the meeting and invite him to make a short opening statement if he should wish to do so. I thank you, Convener. Members of the committee will be aware that the laying of this draft legislation follows the engagement with stakeholders who highlighted a small but significant divergence of approach between LBTT and SDLT in relation to the group relief provisions. That divergence related to scenarios where shared pledge type arrangements were in place. Having considered this and accepted the need for change, I announced in March my intention to launch a consultation on draft legislation to make clear that group relief should be available where such arrangements are in place. I am grateful to everyone who took the time to respond to that consultation and to Revenue Scotland for their considered and valuable input to the Scottish Government's thinking. All uh, consultation respondents were in favour of this decision uh, to amend LBTT legislation and this view seems to be echoed across the Chamber during consideration of the recent LBTT uh, Bill. The focus today is on the draft order, but you will be aware of the widespread calls for any change to be made retrospective. Indeed, two members of this committee explicitly raised this issue during stage three consideration of the recent LBTT bill. We will appreciate that it is not normal practice to make changes retrospectively and that this is a matter which requires careful thought. However, after detailed consideration, I can confirm that if this order is approved by the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government does intend to bring forward legislation to make it retrospective in effect an appropriate future opportunity. And I note that the position is informed in particular by the Scottish Government's original policy intent in terms of group relief. And convener, I'd be very happy to take questions. I'm glad you clarified issues around retrospectivity. Has anybody got any questions of the Cabinet Secretary today? OK, if there are no questions, we now move to Agenda Item 3, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move S5M12474, that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Land and Bills and Transaction Tax Group Relief Modification Scotland Order 2018 draft be approved. Do mm -hmm. members have any further questions? No further questions, and I put the motion. The question is that motion S5M12474 be agreed or well agreed. We are all agreed. Uh, we now turn to a further piece of subordinate legislation relating to the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, as we take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on the Lands and Building Transaction Tax First Time Buyer Relief Scotland Order 2018. Does the Cabinet Secretary wish to make an opening statement? Very briefly, okay. please, uh, Convener, because members will be aware that as part of the draft Scottish Budget I announced last December, my intention to bring forward the relief from LBTTT focused on supporting first time buyers in Scotland. Uh, the relief is intended to complement our progressive approach to the setting of LBTT rates and bans that has prioritised support for first-time buyers and, of course, a range of other measures uh, to support first-time buyers in Scotland. As a result of consultation, a number of changes have been made to our proposed, uh, proposed approach. In taking account of those changes, I believe that the approach that I have taken uh, in terms of setting the eligibility criteria for the relief is sensible and appropriate and will minimise complexity as much as possible. In terms of the impact, uh, as members of the committee will be aware, raising the nil rate threshold for first-time buyers to £175,000 will mean that an estimated 80% of first-time buyers will pay no tax if the relief is agreed. In addition, those purchasing a home above the threshold will see a £600 reduction in their tax, regardless of the purchase price of their home. Uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has independently estimated that the policy will benefit around 12,000 first-time buyers each year, and I'm happy to answer any questions that there may be. Uh, I think Murdo Fraser may have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I was just wondering, Cabinet Secretary, um, how uh, the term first-time buyer is actually defined in the instrument, and how will that be uh, policed? 
Uh, first of all, the, the policing uh, and monitoring, of course, would be for Revenue Scotland as the appropriate tax collection agency using their established uh, procedures. And I, I'm, I'm familiar that the Revenue Scotland has communicated with the committee in terms of their, their general approach and some um, specifics. In terms of eligibility, and I think that's why consultation was really important to get a full understanding, um, there's eligibility uh, criteria um, set out in terms of first-time buyers. And I suppose some of the considerations we're thinking about um, if you had um, a joint ownership, prospective ownership, should it be uh, just one eligible or should it be both? And we've, we've set out clearly in the, the instrument, the regulations, a range of criteria uh, such as um, uh, positions around, uh, I could go through the detail, I think it is in the instrument, but essentially, if the member wishes, I can go through the criteria, but that's what we consulted upon and that's what's in the instrument. It's up to the member if he wishes me to, to read that criteria out. But he does? I, I don't think he'd, I don't think no, Okay, that's, that's, that's a relief for us all then, um, but that's what we consulted upon, essentially. Thank you. There have been no further questions. We now move to item five, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move s 5 m one two. 473 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Land and Building Transaction Tax First Time Buyer Relief Scotland Order 2018 be approved. I move. Members, have any further comments? No further comments. And I put the question. The question is that motion S5M 12473 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are all agreed. Um, the committee will now publish a short report on both of these. Um, instruments in the coming days, setting our position on both orders. Thank the Cabinet Secretary's officials and I'll close this meeting in the Finance Committee.